Wednesday, I rang up Phyllis. It used to come upon her periodically, when we had had a longer spell than usual in London, that she could not stand the works of civilization any longer without a break for refreshment. If it happened that I were free, I was allowed along too. If not, she withdrew to commune with nature on her own. As a rule, she returned spiritually refurbished in the course of a week or so. This time, however, the communion had already been going on for almost a fortnight, and there was still no sign of the postcard which customarily preceded her return by a short head when it did not come on the following day. The telephone down in Rose Cottage rang forlornly for some time. I was on the point of giving up when she answered it. "'Hello, darling,' said her voice. "'I might have been the butcher or the income tax,' I reproved her. Oh, they'd have given up more quickly. Sorry, I was so long answering, I was busy outside. What, digging the garden? I asked, hopefully. No, as a matter of fact, I was bricklaying. Uh, this line's not good. It, it sounded like bricklaying. It was, darling. Oh, I said, bricklaying. It's very fascinating when you get into it. Did you know there are all kinds of bonds and things? Flemish bond and English bond and so on? And you have things called headers, and other things called... What is this, darling? A tool shed or something? No, just a wall, like Balbus and Mr. Churchill. I read somewhere that in moments of stress, Mr. Churchill used to find that it gave him tranquillity, and I thought that anything that could tranquillise Mr. Churchill was probably worth following up. Well, I hope it has cured the stress. Oh, it has. It's very soothing. I love the way when you put the brick down, the mortar squadges out at the sides, and you... Darling, the minutes are ticking up. I rang you up to say that you are wanted here. That's sweet of you, darling, but leaving a job half... It's not me. I mean, it is me, but not only. The EBC wants a word with us. What about? I don't really know. They're being cagey, but insistent. Oh, when do they want to see us? Freddy suggested a dinner on Friday. Can you manage that? There was a pause. Yes, I think I'll be able to finish. All right, I'll be on that train that gets into Paddington about six. Good, I'll meet it. Uh, there is another reason too, Phil. It being? The running sand, darling. The unturned coverlet, the tarnished thimble, the dull, unflavoured drops from life's clepsydra, the mic you've been rehearsing. What else had I to do? Couldn't you have taken Mildred out to dinner? Well, I tried that, and she does begin to grow on one as one sees more of her. It's surprising, really. All the same, Mike. I happen to know that Mildred has been in Scotland for the last three weeks. Oh, did you say Mildred? I thought, come off it, darling. See you Friday. I shall hold my breath until then, I assured her. We were only twenty minutes late, but Freddie Whittier might have been desiccating for some hours from the urgency with which we were swept into the bar. He disappeared into the mob round the counter with a nicely controlled violence and presently emerged with a selection of double and single sherries on a tray. Doubles first, he said. Soon his mind broadened out of the single track. He looked more himself and noticed things. He even noticed Phyllis's hands, the abraded knuckles on the right, the large piece of plaster on the left. He frowned and seemed about to speak, but thought better of it. I observed him covertly examining my face and then my hands. "'My wife, I explained, has been down in the country. "'The start of the bricklaying season, you know.' "'He looked relieved rather than interested. "'Nothing wrong with the old team spirit?' he inquired with a casual air. "'We shook our heads. "'Good,' he said, because I've got a job for you two. "'He went on to expound. "'It seemed that one of the EBC's favourite sponsors had put a proposition to them.' This sponsor had apparently been feeling for some time that a description, some photographs and definite evidence of the nature of the deep's creatures was well overdue. A man of perception, I said. For the last five or six years... Shut up, Mike, said my dear wife briefly. Things, Freddy went on, have in his opinion now reached a pass where he might as well spend some of his money while it still has value. I might even bring in some valuable information. At the same time, he doesn't see why he shouldn't get some benefit out of the information if it is forthcoming, so he proposes to fit out and send out an expedition to find out what it can. And, of course, the whole thing will be tied up with exclusive rights and so on. By the way, this is highly confidential. We don't want the BBC to get onto it first. 
Look, Freddy, I said, for several years now, everybody's been trying to get on to it, let alone the BBC. What the... Expedition? Where to? asked Phyllis practically. That, said Freddy, was naturally our first question. But he doesn't know. The whole decision on a location is in Bocker's hands. Bocker? I exclaimed. Is he becoming an untouchable or something? His stock has recovered quite a bit, Freddy admitted. And as this fellow, the sponsor, said, if you leave out all the outer space nonsense, the rest of Bocker's pronouncements have had a pretty high score, higher than anyone else's anyway. So he went to Bocker and said, Look here, these things that came up on Sephira and April Island, where do you think they are most likely to appear next, or at any rate, soon? Bocker wouldn't tell him, of course. But they walked, and the upshot was that the sponsor will subsidise an expedition led by Bocker to a region to be selected by Bocker. What is more, Bocker also selects the personnel, and part of the selection, the EBC's blessing and your approval, could be you too. He was always my favourite ographer, said Phyllis. When do we start? Wait a minute, I put in. Once upon a time, an ocean voyage used to be recommended for the health. Recently, however, far from being healthy, air, said Freddy, exclusively air. People have doubtless got a lot of personal information about the things the other way, but we would prefer you to be in a position to bring it back. Such thoughtfulness is greatly appreciated, I assured him. Good. We'll go and talk it over with Bocker tomorrow, and then come round to my office and we'll go into contracts and all the rest of it. Phyllis wore an abstracted air at intervals during the evening. When we got home, I said, If you'd rather not take this up, nonsense. Of course we're going, she said. But do you think subsidise means we can get suitable clothes and things on expenses? Even, I said, surveying the scene, even a diet of lotuses can pall. I like idleness in the sun, said Phyllis. I reflected, I think it is more than that, more than just like... I mean, I suggested, 20th century woman appears to regard sunlight as a kind of cosmetic effulgence with a light aphrodisiac content, which makes it a funny thing that none of her female ancestors are recorded as seeing it the same way. Men, of course, just go on sweating in it from century to century. Yes, said Phyllis. You can't answer a whole observation like that with simply yes, I pointed out. I have reached a comfortable stage of enervation where I can say yes to practically anything. It is a well-known effect of the tropics, often underlined by Mr. Maugham. Darling, Mr. Maugham depends very largely on the wrong people saying yes, even outside the tropics. It is not so much a matter of temperature as his system of triangulation, in which he is second only to Euclid, another bestseller, by the way, makes one wonder whether a Trinitarian approach to literature might... You're rambling. That's probably the heat, too. Let's just contemplate idly, shall we? So we resumed the occupation which had been the leading feature of the last few weeks. From where we sat at an umbrellaed table in front of the mysteriously named Grand Hotel Britannia e la Justicia, it was possible to direct this contemplation on tranquillity or activity. Tranquillity was on the right. Intensely blue water glittered for miles until it was ruled off by a hard, straight horizon line. The shore, running round like a bow, ended in a palm-tufted headland which trembled mirage-wise in the heat. A backcloth which must have looked just the same when it formed a part of the Spanish main. To the left was a display of life as conducted in the capital and only town of the island of Escondida. The island's name derived, presumably, from erratic seamanship in the past, which had caused ships to arrive mistakenly at one of the Caymans. But through all the vicissitudes of those parts, it had managed to retain it, and much of its Spanishness, too. The houses looked Spanish. The temperament had a Spanish quality. In the language there was more Spanish than English, and from where we were sitting at the corner of the open space known indifferently as the plaza or the square, the church at the far end, with the bright market stalls in front of it, looked positively picture-book Spanish. The population, however, was somewhat less so, and ranged from sunburnt white to coal black. Only a bright red British pillar-box prepared one for the surprise of learning that the place was called Smithtown. And even that took on romance when one learnt also that the Smith commemorated had been a pirate in a prosperous way. Behind us, 
and therefore behind the hotel, one of the two mountains which make Escondida climbed steeply, emerging far above as a naked peak with a scarf of greenery about its shoulders. Between the mountain's foot and the sea stretched a tapering rocky shelf with the town clustered on its wider end. And there also had clustered for five weeks the Boca expedition. Boca had contrived a probability system all his own. Eventually, his eliminations had given him a list of ten islands as likely to be attacked, and the fact that four of them were in the Caribbean area settled our course. That was about as far as he cared to go, simply on paper, and it landed us all at Kingston, Jamaica. There we stayed a week in company with Ted Jarvey, the cameraman, Leslie Bray, the recordist, and Muriel Flynn, one of the technical assistants, while Bocker himself and his two male assistants flew about in an armed coastal patrol aircraft put at his disposal by the authorities and considered the rival attractions of Grand Cayman, Little Cayman, Cayman Brack and Escondida. The reasoning which led to their final choice of Escondida was no doubt very nice, so that it seemed a pity that two days after the aircraft had finished ferrying us and our gear to Smithtown, it should have been a large village on Grand Cayman which suffered the first visitation in those parts. But if we were disappointed, we were also impressed. It was clear that Boca really had been doing something more than a high-class eeny meeny miny mo, and had brought off a very near miss. The plane took four of us over there as soon as we had news. Unfortunately, we learnt little. There were grooves on the beach, but they had been greatly trampled by the time we arrived. Out of 250 villagers, about a score had got away by fast running. The rest had simply vanished. The whole affair had taken place in darkness, so that no one had seen much. Each survivor felt an obligation to give any inquirer his money's worth, and the whole thing was almost folklore already. Bocca announced that we should stay where we were. Nothing would be gained by dashing hither and thither. We would be just as likely to miss the occasion as to find it. Even more likely, for Escondida, in addition to its other qualities, had the virtue of being a one-town island, so that when an attack did come, and he was sure sooner or later it would, Smithtown must almost certainly be the objective. We hoped he knew what he was doing, but in the next two weeks we doubted it. The radio brought reports of a dozen raids, all save one small affair in the Azores, were in the Pacific. We began to have a depressed feeling that we were in the wrong hemisphere. When I say we, I must admit I mean chiefly me. The others continued to analyse the reports and go stolidly ahead with their preparations. One point was that there was no record of an assault taking place by day. Lights, therefore, would be necessary. Once the town council had been convinced that it would cost them nothing, we were all impressed into the business of fixing improvised floods on trees, posts and the corners of buildings all over Smithtown, though with greater proliferation towards the waterside, all of which, in the interests of Ted's cameras, had to be wired back to a switchboard in his hotel room. The inhabitants assumed that a fiesta of some kind was in preparation. The council considered it a harmless form of lunacy, but were pleased to be paid for the extra current we consumed. Most of us were growing more cynical, until the affair at Gallows Island, which, though Gallows was in the Bahamas, put the wind up the whole Caribbean nevertheless. Port Anne, the chief town on Gallows, and three large coastal villages there were raided the same night. About half the population of Port Anne and a much higher proportion from the villages disappeared entirely. Those who survived had either shut themselves in their houses or run away, but this time there were plenty of people who agreed that they had seen things like tanks, like military tanks, they said, but larger, emerge from the water and come sliding up the beaches. Owing to the darkness, the confusion and the speed with which most of the informants had either made off or hidden themselves, there were only imaginative reports of what these tanks from the sea had then done. The only verifiable fact was that from the four points of attack, more than a thousand people in all had vanished during the night. All around there was a prompt change of heart. Every islander in every island shed his indifference and sense of security and was immediately convinced that his own home would be the next scene of assault. Ancient, uncertain weapons were dug out of cupboards and cleaned up. Patrols were organised and for the first night or two of their existence went on duty with a fine swagger. Talks on an inter-island flying defence system were proposed. When, however, the next week went by without trace of further trouble anywhere in the area, enthusiasm waned. Indeed, for that week there was a pause in subsea activity all over. 
The only report of a raid came from the Curiles, for some Slavonic reason undated and therefore assumed to have spent some time under microscope examination from every security angle. By the tenth day after the alarm, Escondida's natural spirit of manana had fully reasserted itself. By night and siesta it slept soundly. The rest of the time it drowsed, and we with it. It was difficult to believe that we shouldn't go on like that for years, so we were settling down to it, some of us. Muriel explored happily among the island flora. Johnny Talton, the pilot who was constantly standing by, did most of it in a cafe where a charming senorita was teaching him the patois. Leslie had also gone native to the extent of acquiring a guitar, which we could now hear tinkling through the open window above us. Phyllis and I occasionally told one another about the scripts we might write if we had the energy. Only Bocker and his two closest assistants, Bill Wayman and Alfred Haig, retained an air of purpose. If the sponsor could have seen us, he might well have felt dubious about his money's worth. While we still contemplated idly, Leslie's voice up above started on its repertoire with O Sole Mio. The other part of the repertoire, La Paloma, would undoubtedly follow. I groaned and sipped at my gin sling. I think, said Phyllis, that while we are here we really ought to dig up... Oh, dear! Out of the street leading to the waterfront came a din with which the mere human voice could not compete. Presently, a very small, coffee-coloured boy, almost eclipsed by a very large hat, emerged leading a yoke of rhythmically swaying oxen. Behind them, a steel-shod mountain sledge clattered, squealed and rasped on the cobbles. When it had descended, loaded with bananas, we thought it noisy. Now that it was unladen, the row was fiendish. One could only wait while the oxen made their unhurried way across the plaza. Presently it became possible to hear Leslie again, now dealing with La Paloma. I think, Phyllis began once more, that we ought to find out what we can about this smith while we are here. I mean, he might turn out to be a kind of illegitimate hornblower, or we might be able to turn him into one. How much do you know about square-rigged ships? Me? Why should I know anything about square-rigged ships? Well... Nearly all men seemed to feel it incumbent upon them to appear to know something about Shiv, so I thought she broke off. La Paloma had just finished with a triumphant chord, and the guitar pranced off on an entirely different rhythm. Leslie's voice rose. Oh, I'm burning my brains in the back room, almost setting my cortex alight, to find a new thing to go crack-boom and blow up a xenobathite. Oh, I've pondered the nuclear thermals and every conceivable ray. I've mugged up on technical journals, and now I'm just starting to pray. What I'd like is the germ of the know-how to live at five tons per square inch. Then to bash at the bathies below now would verge on the fringe of a cinch. I've scouted above ultraviolet, I've burrowed around infrared, and the... Poor Leslie, I said. You see what happens in a climate like this, Phil? We are being warned. Back room, crack boom. For heaven's sake. Softening sets in without the victim being aware of it. We must give Bocca a time limit. A week from now to produce his phenomena. If not, he'll have had it, as far as we are concerned. Any longer, and real deterioration will get us. We too shall start composing songs in outdated rhythms. Our moral fibres will rot so that we shall find ourselves going around doing dreadful things like rhyming thermals with journals. What do you say, one week's grace? Well, Phyllis began doubtfully. A step sounded behind us as Leslie came out of the hotel door. Hello, you two, he said cheerfully. Time for a quick one before El Almuerzo. Hear the new song? A smasher, isn't it? Phyllis called it The Boffin's Lament, but I suggest The Lay of the Baffled Boffin. Three gin slings, OK, and he departed to fetch them. Phyllis was studying the view. So, I remarked grimly, well, I said a week and I'll stand by it, though it'll very likely be fatal, which was truer than I knew. Less than a week nearly was fatal. Darling, stop worrying that moon now and come to bed. No soul, that's the trouble. I often wonder why I married you. It's by no means impossible to have too much soul. Look at Lawrence Hope. Pig, I hate you. Darling, it's late, nearly one o'clock. On Escondida, life laughs at clocksmiths. Wasted, darling. You mislaid your notebook this afternoon, remember? Oh, I do hate you. Sweet, sweet Diana, take me from this man. I got up and joined her at the window. See, she said, 
A ship, an isle, a sickle moon, so fragile, so eternal. Isn't it lovely? We gazed out across the empty plaza, past the sleeping houses, over the silvered sea. I want it. It's one of the things I'm putting away to remember, she said. Faintly, from behind the opposite houses, down by the waterfront, came the tinkling of a guitar. El amor tonto y dulce, she sighed. Why don't you see and hear what I see and hear, Mike? You don't, you know. Mightn't it be a little dull for us if I did, both of us crying upon Diana, for instance? I have my own gods. She turned to look at me. I suppose you have. But they are rather obscure ones, aren't they? You think so? I don't find them difficult. I'll quote Flecker back to you. And some to Mecca turn to pray, and I toward thy bed, Yasmin. Oh, she said. Oh, Mike. And then, suddenly, the distant player dropped his guitar with a clang. Down by the waterfront, a voice called out, unintelligible but alarming. Then other voices. A woman screamed. We turned to look at the houses that screened the little harbour. Listen, said Phyllis. Mike, do you think... She broke off at the sound of a couple of shots. It must be Mike. They must be coming. There was an increasing hubbub in the distance. In the square itself, windows were opening, people calling questions from one to another. A man ran out of a door, round the corner, and disappeared down the short street that led to the water. There was more shouting now, more screaming, too. Among it, the crack of three or four more shots. I turned from the window and thumped on the wall which separated us from the next room. Hey, Ted, I shouted, turn up your lights. Down by the waterfront, man. Lights. I heard his faint OK. He must have been out of bed already, for almost as I turned back to the window, the lights began to go on in batches. There was nothing unusual to be seen except a dozen or more men pelting across the square towards the harbour. Quite abruptly, the noise which had been rising in crescendo was cut off. Ted's door slammed. His boots thudded along the corridor past our room. Beyond the houses, the yelling and screaming broke out again, louder than before, as if it had gained force from being briefly damned. I must, I began, and then stopped when I found that Phyllis was no longer beside me. I looked across the room and saw her in the act of locking the door. I went over. I must go down there. I must see what's no, she said. She turned and planted her back firmly against the door. She looked rather like a severe angel barring a road, except that angels are assumed to wear respectable cotton nightdresses, not nylon. But, Phil, it's the job. It's what we're here for. I don't care. We wait a bit. She stood without moving, severe angel expression now modified by that of mutinous small girl. I held out my hand. Phil, please give me that key. No, she said, and flung it across the room through the window. It clattered on the cobbles outside. I gazed after it in astonishment. That was not at all the kind of thing one associated with Phyllis. All over the now floodlit square, people were now hurriedly converging towards the street on the opposite side. I turned back. Phil, please get away from that door. She shook her head. Don't be a fool, Mike. You've got a job to do. That's just what I know it isn't. Don't you see? The only reports we've had at all were from the people who didn't rush out to find out what was happening. The ones who either hid or ran away. I was angry with her, but not too angry for the sense of that to reach me and make me pause. She followed up. It's what Freddy said. The point of our coming at all is that we should be able to go back and tell them about it. That's all very well, but no, look there. She nodded towards the window. People were still converging upon the street that led to the waterside, but they were no longer going into it. A solid crowd was piling up at the entrance. Then, while I looked, the previous scene started to go into reverse. The crowd backed and began to break up at its edges. More men and women came out of the street, thrusting it back until it was dispersing all over the square. I went closer to the window to watch. Phyllis left the door and came and stood beside me. Presently we spotted Ted, turret-lensed cine camera in hand, hurrying back. What is it? I called down. God knows! Can't get through. There's a panic up the street there. They all say it's coming this way, whatever it is. If it does, I'll get a shot from my window. Can't work this thing in that mob. He glanced back and then disappeared into the hotel doorway below us. People were still pouring into the square and breaking into a run when they reached a point where there was room to run. There had been no further sound of shooting, but from time to time there would be another outbreak of shouts and screams somewhere at the hidden far end of the short street. Among those headed back to the hotel came Dr. Bocker himself and the pilot, Johnny Talton. Bocker stopped below and shouted up. 
Heads popped out of various windows. He looked them over. Where's Alfred? he asked. No one seemed to know. If anyone sees him, call him inside, Bocker instructed. The rest of you stay where you are. Observe what you can, but don't expose yourselves till we know more about it. Ted, keep all your lights on. Leslie? Just on my way with the portable recorder, Doc, said Leslie's voice. No, you're not. Sling the mic outside the window, if you like, but keep under cover yourself, and that goes for everyone for the present. But, Doc, what is it? What we don't know, so keep inside until we find out why it makes people scream. Where the hell's Miss Flynn? Oh, you're there. Right, keep watching, Miss Flynn. He turned to Johnny and exchanged a few inaudible words with him. Johnny nodded and made off round the back of the hotel. Bocker himself looked across the square again and then came in, shutting the door behind him. Running, or at least hurrying, figures were still scattering over the square in all directions, but no more were emerging from the street. Those who had reached the far side turned back to look, hovering close to doorways or alleyways in which they could jump swiftly if necessary. Half a dozen men with guns or rifles laid themselves down on the cobbles, their weapons all aimed at the mouth of the street. Everything was much quieter now, except for a few sounds of sobbing, a tense, expectant silence held the whole scene. And then, in the background, one became aware of a grinding, scraping noise, not loud, but continuous. The door of a small house close to the church opened. The priest in a long black robe stepped out. A number of people nearby ran towards him and then knelt round him. He stretched out both arms as though to encompass and guard them all. The noise from the narrow street sounded like the heavy dragging of metal upon stone. Three or four rifles fired suddenly, almost together. Our angle of view still stopped us from seeing what they fired at, but they let go a number of rounds each. Then the men jumped to their feet and ran further back, almost to the inland side of the square. There they turned round and reloaded. From the street came a noise of cracking timbers and falling bricks and glass. Then we had our first sight of a sea tank. A curve of dull grey metal sliding into the square, carrying away the lower corner of a house front as it came. Shots cracked at it from half a dozen different directions. The bullets splattered or thudded against it without effect. Slowly, heavily, with an air of inexorability, it came on, grinding and scraping across the cobbles. It was inclining slightly to its right, away from us and towards the church, carrying away more of the corner house, unaffected by the plaster, bricks and beams that fell on it and slithered down its sides. More shots smacked against it or ricocheted away, whining, but it kept steadily on, thrusting itself into the square at something under three miles an hour, massively undeflectable. Soon we were able to see the whole of it. Imagine... An elongated egg which has been halved down its length and set flat side to the ground, with the pointed end foremost. Consider this egg to be between 30 and 35 feet long, of a drab, lustreless, leaden colour, and you will have a fair picture of the sea tank as we saw it pushing into the square. There was no way of seeing how it was propelled. There may have been rollers underneath, but it seemed and sounded simply to grate forward on its metal belly with plenty of noise, but none of the machinery. It did not jerk to turn as a tank does, but neither did it shear like a car. It simply moved to the right on a diagonal, still pointing forwards. Close behind it followed another exactly similar contrivance, which slanted its way to the left in our direction, wrecking the house front on the nearer corner of the street as it came. A third kept straight ahead into the middle of the square and then stopped. At the far end, the crowd that had knelt about the priest scrambled to its feet and fled. The priest himself stood his ground. He barred the thing's way. His right hand held a cross extended against it. His left was raised, fingers spread and palm outward to halt it. The thing moved on, neither faster nor slower, as if he had not been there. Its curved flank pushed him aside a little as it came. Then it, too, stopped. A few seconds later, the one up our end of the square reached what was apparently its appointed position and also stopped. Troops will establish themselves at first objective in extended order, I said to Phyllis as we regarded the three evenly spaced out in the square. This isn't haphazard. Now what? Crack and Wakes was written by John Wyndham and read by Stephen Moore. The programme was produced in Belfast by Susan Carson.